and Morgan Lamell from People for Bikes in Boulder, and um, we like to refer to ourselves as 3M. Um, so if you ask us a question, you can just go, mm. right, let's all try that. Put your hand in the air. So we're going to create a sonic resonance that's going to go up to the universe and make change happen. That's how it happens. So there you go. Um, so again, our objectives in this session are to kind of explore these fresh approaches to our, both articulating change, explaining how it happens, and then making it practically applicable and, and actually launching the change that we want to see in the world. Um, again, it, it's a little bit theory and a little bit of putting it into action, so we hope that it'll be useful for you in some way, shape, and form. My topic is going to be the theory of change and explaining why, as an advocacy organization, we decided to create and adopt one. Uh, then Morgan is going to take over and talk about how that transfers to a strategic planning kind of environment. And then finally, Marielle is going to talk about organizational psychology, motivational theory, and that's a dollar sign. I don't know why. Um, and so then how does, how does the change actually translate to uh, moving the people in public sectors that you want to do things differently, right? And just, again, we are all three advocates from advocacy organizations, bike pad, transit uh, advocates, but it doesn't mean that this can only be done by a nonprofit organization. It's applicable to all kinds of different settings. So before we get started, we thought we'd uh, just ask a quick introductory question about why are you here? Why did you pick us? Is it because we're good looking? Is it because we're 3M? Um, or what, did, what are you just really hoping to take away from this session, just really briefly? Anyone? Or you just walked into this room? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm a volunteer advocate, and uh, in my community, we desperately need to rally more advocates. And I'm wanting to see how we can create a platform that really engages people. Great. Okay, we'll try and, this is helpful for us so we can try and hit those topics. Um, I work, I'm paid to work as an advocate and I'm um, working with the city and the school district in my community to start a safe rest of school funding process. And I am interested in learning how to build a stakeholder group that's inclusive and motivate both our consultants and our community members to be talking to each other and problem solving effectively. Okay, great. Yep, so pulling people together around a common cause. Yep, one more. Um, I'm a chair of a local cycling coalition in Halifax, and um, I'm essentially here to, to uh, think more about um, how to provide strategic direction to our organization, but also reach out to more members in our community. Great. Okay. Well, we're going to solve all your problems right, right, right now, starting now. Uh, so, the first topic is theory of change, and um, I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of what it is, why we decided to do it, and what we're hoping to um, accomplish through creating one. So, just a quick working definition. The theory of change is kind of painting this picture of how a group, an organization, a community um, envisions that change will happen. So, what are the building blocks, what are the stepping stones, what are the kind of the near, mid, and long term outcomes that need to be in place in order for this ultimate change to happen. It's typically expressed in kind of a graphic model. This is an example. Um, and it also shows not only the building blocks, but the causal pathways between each stage of change. So it kind of has, it has some logic built into it. Um, but this is the, this is the uh, kicker for me and for our organization. It provides this missing middle between what you're doing as an organization, all your activities and your flurry of, of work, and the ultimate change in the world that you want to see. I think we often make these leaps in this, I love this cartoon, that, you know, and then a miracle happens. And we have walkable, bikeable transit nirvana in, in the United Place making nirvana in, in, you know, the country or in the world um, because we taught bicycle education. You know, so what actually occurs in between there? So that's why we're, one of the reasons we're doing it. Some of the other reasons, and I'll just be blunt, um, in the last five years in our hiring processes at Active Trans, I can think of at least three to four occasions when we had a candidate in the room that we were hiring, and their first question, you know, we asked them all their questions, what do you want, what do you want to work at Active Trans, what are your qualifications, and then 
at the end we say, do you have any questions for us? And they say, what is your theory of change? <laughs> the three of us in the room kind of go, oh. uh, well, I don't know. We have a strategic plan. Does that count? So we start kind of getting the cue that this is a thing, right, that people are seeking and want to know about. The second big reason is that funders are starting to ask for it. So grant applications are saying, please include a copy of your theory of change. And we were like, oh, shit. You know, we don't have one of those. Um, the third reason is that in working mostly with the public health sector, uh, they are big into this. Any public health or education professionals in the room, right? So you all, and who else just knows what a theory of change is? Who am I talking to who already knows what I'm talking about? Okay, great, half of you. So let's just skip to the next speaker. Just kidding. Um, so a lot of our partners, um, public health, education, academia in particular, use theories of change all the time. And so we thought, well, you know, if we had one that mapped things out, we could, it would be much easier to you know, cross-collaborate and find those similar goals and outcomes that we're all seeking to decide what we're going to do together. Sometimes theory of change and logic model are used interchangeably. Um, we decided to make a, a clear distinction between the two. And this organization, Tools for Development, also has done so. Um, the reason we wanted to do that is we wanted to clear, put this clear, like kind of firewall between how does the world work and how are we, what part are we going to play in it, right? So we wanted to remove ourselves from the equation, but to take our inputs, as it were, out of the idea of how change happens, because you get into this navel gazing kind of thing, right, as an organization where. You're talking about, well, you know, if, if only, going back to bike, bike education, if only every school in the United States was teaching bike education at second, fifth, and eighth grade levels, everybody would behave right on the roadway. Well, that's, that's fulfilling an outcome because of what you want to do, right? I want to teach bike education, so I think it's the most important thing in the world. Well, we want to take ourselves out of the equation and figure out how change happens independent of us so that we can then figure out our role in it. Um, a couple of different differences that between theory of change and kind of a logic framework is big picture versus detailed, um, items outside your control, influences on change that you have nothing to do with versus what you do specifically, um, what we're going to achieve versus what we do, issue oriented versus project oriented and so on. So I'm going to take you very quickly through uh -oh, um, some of the steps of theory of change. These first four are the most important. So the first one, the first thing you do in creating theory of change is deciding on what that ultimate outcome is. We call it transportation nirvana, and our big ultimate outcome is something like um, the Chicago land region will have a connected, equitable, um, you know, perfect transportation network that serves all people, right? So you ask your question, what does the change in the world that we're trying to achieve look like? From there, and this is the most important piece of theory of change, and folks who are in the education industry understand how this works, um, you do a backward mapping. You ask yourself the question, what preconditions need to exist in order for that ultimate outcome to happen? And it's a cascading kind of thing. So you say, what are the biggest things that need to happen? Well, we need to have a network, we need to have decision makers, you know, you know. and then you ask yourself the same question again. What needs to be in place in order for these outcomes to come true? And you just keep stepping it down. The question that, the, the hardest question we had to answer is when do you stop? You know? <laughs> when do you stop going down the, you know, you get to the granular level of I need to wake up in the morning in order for this change to happen. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. And um, our strategic plan committee said to me at one point, for the love of God, please stop. Uh, that's enough. We're done. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it can be a little tricky on that one. But you'll know. But you'll just know. you know when you're there. <laughs> the last two steps are you need to identify, call out your assumptions. So, in, in, for example, in our, in our theory of change, it was, we're assuming that we will have a U.S. government that <laughs> continues to tax people and pay for transportation infrastructure, right? Not such a crazy question to ask yourself at this point in time, right? right. Um, but, you know, that, that's a simplistic way to say, you know, let's all get on the same page of what we're thinking implicitly, with our implicit understandings of the way the world works, so that this whole model doesn't crash and burn because we didn't talk about it. 
And then finally, indicators. We know in the bike ped transit world in particular that indicators can be very difficult to come by, especially in terms of usage and things like that. So how are you going to measure if you're making progress? Um, if you don't have data to support one of your outcomes, don't let that stop you. Go ahead and, and put in place what you think logically needs to happen in terms of outcomes. And if data's missing, you know, you can work on trying to find a way for somebody to start collecting that data. There are different graphic approaches to this. This is the uh, Convergence Partnership out of California. And um, as you can see, over on the, the thing I want to point out is that the inputs, the things that the Convergent Part Convergence Partnership is going to do are minimized. They're way over on the left with just an arrow. It doesn't talk about what I'm going to do as an organization. It's focused on the outcomes and the process of change and how it works. Um, what I like about this model is I envision it kind of spinning and spinning faster and faster in that circle until some trivial force spits out the change over to the left. And then it's like this gentle cascading down to social equity and justice and, and healthy people. Uh, a couple of more, this is a furniture bank, and um, again, the inputs are minimized over on the left. This is more uh, kind of linear. And uh, this IDEX, the uh, International Development Exchange, uh, this is more you know, infographic-y. And again, the, the inputs are just the droplets in this, in this model. So the great reveal, ta-da! This is the Active Transportation Alliance Theory of Change. I'm not going to go into the details because you'll fall asleep. But our ultimate income is outcome, excuse me, is the middle. It's this vision for success circled in yellow. Down beneath it are our cascading um, preconditions. But we wanted to focus on the above, the impacts. You know, how does the, not only does, how does the change, what are the di dynamics that make change occur, but what do we ultimately want to see? We want to get to an excellent quality of life for all people, right? And all those little bubbles at the top are, most of them are measurable, right? So better overall health and a sense of community cohesion is a little harder, but track crashes and reduce traffic crashes, reduce violence, increase social equity, some stuff like that. So, um, The last step, and this is where we are in the process right now, is connecting up our strategic plan to the theory of change. As you'll see, we are nowhere in this model. Active Transportation Alliance has nothing to do with this theory of change. What we're going to do next is identify our role, what we're good at, your SWOT analysis and all that stuff, what role we can play, and where we need to activate partners to start moving some of those cogs down at the bottom. So what do we need academic partners to do? What do we need the housing community to do? What do we need, you know, so on and so forth? Here are some resources. You can look at those later. And with that, I will lead us to a transitional question as Morgan comes up and starts her piece. Uh, along the lines of who's worked on theory of change, what's your experience been with theories of change? Are they useful? Are they a pain in the butt? I'm actually interested because I think it's a terminology issue because I've worked in theory of behavior change, which is probably a slightly different thing. Um, slightly different, but, but similar. But yeah, I mean, that's why I was sort of interested because actually understanding how people make their decisions defeats into that process. But right. Certainly, you know, I think the exercise of understanding people you're dealing with really needs to feed in very early. Right. Rather than just watching on other team. Yeah, exactly, what's, yeah. What's possible. Yeah, uh, we, I bumped into a lot of the theory of behavior change, and that's like the individual. The indi how's the individual changing what they do? And we stay more at the systems level, kind of the pot, because that's the type of organization we are. Some people might be into that, the behavior change, the individual piece. Uh, another challenge is like figuring out your scope and your scale. Like, you know, we want world peace. You know, um, that can be a little too much, maybe. You want to scale that back to more, something more specific. Oh, uh, it's individual change with Douglas McKenzie Moore. Mostly. Douglas McKenzie Moore? Yeah. It's the standard of behavior changes. Right. Do, anything. Do something, yeah. Right. A quick question. Maybe it's better for afterwards. I don't know. <coughs> I'll just throw it out. I'm just wondering, as an advocacy organization, who you engaged in that process? That's an excellent question. We started with a small committee because that was the recommendation from the resource that we used most heavily. Um, we started with a small committee, but we went not only out to our staff and tested it, went to the board and tested it, but we had an external committee, particularly of equity folks. Um, we brought in about 25 people and did a great big 
process with them to say, does this make any sense to you? Are we, you know, to get away from that navel gazing because that's so destructive, you know, if, if you're just talking to yourself. So we did have an equity panel and we plan to bring them back in and keep them permanently to keep us honest um, and have them convene maybe quarterly. Okay, take away more. Hi, I'm Morgan Lomley. I uh, work with People for Bikes, and I um, People for Bikes was charged uh, in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation to develop a strategic plan for the Bicycling Coalition of the Ozarks and basically transform Northwest Arkansas for bicycling. And it's not something that we typically take on, but it was an exciting project, and we did have the opportunity to help transform Northwest Arkansas. So, as I and I was charged with doing this work, and so as I... Um, thought about how am I going to do this with a relatively young advocacy organization, um, mismatched partners here and there. A colleague of mine, a mutual colleague, Melody and mine, um, recommended Theory of Change. So I got on the phone with Melody for an hour. She talked to me all about Theory of Change, gave me all the resources. I looked them all up. And I thought, this is a great idea, but it, I, I don't know how to make it work in my community. It's pretty high level. It's, it's very strategic. It's a, a longer process than I have time for. I only have three or four months to develop a strategic plan to transform bicycling in northwest Arkansas. Um, how am I going to make this work? And so I took bits and pieces of it, and I was able to take the main concept of figuring out what we need to make the change we want happen and develop a nine-page strategic plan that will work for the community. And, and what I'm trying to say is a lot of times these theories can, can almost make us feel stuck. Like we have to follow every single little step in order to get this magical, beautiful graphic and then make the change or the peace happen in the world. And I just wanted to talk about how I took Melody's ideas and the theory of change and turned it into a project or a, um, a plan that, that actually um, use some of the more forward-looking strategic planning tools, but was more realistic for the community. So you'll see, this is what we wanted to do, and that's what everyone wants to do, right? Make bicycling better for everyone. But what does that look like when, when, it, when you're in the community? So these are the things that we needed to, to develop. Um, an operation model for BCO. So BCO is a bicycling coalition of the Ozarks. They were um, a loosely formed, volunteer-run organization, um, but there's an incredible amount of... Um, willpower and, and might and funding in Northwest Arkansas to make bicycling better, put more protected lanes on the ground, get more people riding, a lot of the goals that are probably on, our, uh, are on all our plates. We needed to write a strategic plan, needed to write a business plan, needed to put together budget, and, and if I haven't said this before, there was really nothing there to start with, but I did <coughs> want your, your typical strategic planning process where um, we think about all the things that we want and then we write the plan. What we needed to do was think about all the, um, more think along the lines of what's in place already, um, who do we need to make this happen, and then how can BCO be a small part of that equation, rather than charging BCO with taking it all on themselves. I mentioned some of the limitations. We only have three or four months to put out this, um, this, this plan. Limited capacity, they were running on a shoestring budget, um, their volunteer board was burnt out, um, the, the executive director was basically a volunteer who had another full-time job. Um, the community was very big on doing big things, but didn't really know how to do them, so that's what I call limited institutional knowledge or support. Lots of motivation, lots of ability to, to give money, maybe a little bit of time, but really no wherewithal about how to get it done. Um, the local government, you know, there are... 25 different cities in Northwest Arkansas, very few of them were interested in, in bicycling or knew what bicycling could do for their community. Um, Arkansas doesn't have a great track record of doing great things for bicycling, so there wasn't a local um, area in, in, in the state that we could point to saying, these people are doing this. My point being, sometimes if you have a peer city somewhere doing great things, you can say, hey, why don't we be as good as them and create this competitive atmosphere. None of that. The BCO board was... Um, they were just done with it. They wanted to get off the board and turn. All the different cities weren't doing that much, but um, they wanted to do a little bit more than the next city or didn't want this city being. So this was my problem. <laughs> so, so I talked to Melody and uh, read all about theory of change. And again, I said, I can't probably do all this, but I can take elements of it. So what we wanted to do was figure out how to make a really short plan that made bicycling better in that community 
and using the theory of change as opposed to just your typical strategic plan. So I sat down with this executive director who, again, pretty smart guy, but just not that much time to, to devote to the topic. And he, for two days straight, we sat in a room and he gave, tell, told me everything he knew about the community, what he thought the community needed. Um, and I wrote up a visions and needs statement. It was a very messy 10-page document set with you know, a dozen different goals. And we, that was our starting point. What I wanted to do was put down on paper what we thought the community might need, have it looked very draft and very messy, um, and then ask 12 key stakeholders in the area, so people from the Walton Family Foundation who was funding this, um, elected officials if they were willing to, to be interviewed, um, business leaders, bike retailers, um, people from Walmart, if you know Northwest Arkansas, Walmart, Walmart's a very big economic driver in the area, and there are lots of people who are willing to give some time. Um, advocates, you know, your list of, of people who you would put on the coalition to get this stuff done. And I said, what do you think about this? And they told me. And so then we had phone interviews with 50 stakeholders, and every time I spoke to someone else, I would refine this vision and needs document, almost not taking charge of the program, but saying, okay, this is what someone thinks we need to do, and I'll put this in the document. I'm kind of getting somewhere here, I promise. After each stage, I refined the vision and needs documented the goals, the strategies, and tactics. And what I did was I didn't, I, I feel like a lot of the strategic planning processes out here you take and you say, um, this is what we think you need. And instead, I kept it very fluid for a long time and said, this is what I think we need, what do you think? And the beauty of that is that when you finally do have a plan, the people who contributed to it feel like they have a lot more buy-in into it because a lot of the ideas were theirs, or a lot of the needs reflect their local community's needs or their local organization's needs. So we built a plan with stakeholder input that wasn't necessarily um, uh, uh, as wide-reaching as some people might think, but it was actually practical in that a lot of the things that we said we would do in the plan or feasible. Um, so this is a lot of text, but after speaking to all those people, we came up with two visions. So basically, safe, convenient, and connected transportation and recreation uh, environment, and the one at the bottom there, uh, a cycling culture that encompasses all these different cycling opportunities, whether you want to go mountain biking, or ride to the grocery store, or take your kids to school on, on the back of your bike. Um, and they were very big on having Northwest Arkansas be a, a tourism de uh, destination. So this is what I really want you to remember. So the questions that I asked were, this is, I, I think, what the vision is for the community. And a lot of this was on me, just putting this forward, because there wasn't a lot of capacity around develop, the developing the plan. What do we need to have in place in order to accomplish our vision? So what, it's not, what do we want to do, and then let's figure out how to do it. It's, who are our partners? What resources do we already have? What can we tap into to and add to uh, from a bicycling perspective. What are our areas of focus? What do we believe in? Those are the key questions where I feel like in typical strategic planning processes, this is kind of on its head. And then this is the other key uh, piece of theory of change that I took into this um, really kind of alien process that I made up all, all by myself. Yeah. <laughs> what is your vision of success? How would you define success? And the way that you frame these questions is, um, what's an outcome and what's a need? So bicyclists have safe infrastructure to get where they would like to go. So what's the need for that? Bicyclists need to get to their destination safely. And then this bottom one, if you take away one thing, you want to answer, this must happen so that this happens. You have your vision, but we can't just have our vision and then go out in the community and try to realize that. We need to figure out what we already have in place that can meet that vision. What it, these are some other questions that I ask people that I think were a little bit novel in the strategic planning process that you don't always get when, when, you're, when you're doing your a more traditional planning process. What is the problem we're trying to define? What is BCO's role in achieving this vision? That's a really critical part. BCO can't do it all on its own. We need to make sure that there are other partners in place. Who are the key partners, the partners in achieving the vision? How can Northwest Arkansas be changed for the better thanks to BCO's efforts? Who are the political champions who can help? So instead of BCO taking on a 20-year project, um, having to fundraise millions and millions of dollars, what's the small piece that BCO plays and how can we rely on other community members to make this happen? So at the end, we did have this very short, abbreviated strategic plan that won't sit on a shelf that specifies exactly how we're going to do what we're going to do, what we need to do with all the other community members in place. So just two goals. We don't need to try and solve the world's problems. 
um, each with desired outcomes, key barriers, performance measures, strategies, and tactics. Um, it's achievable given all the current circumstances, all the limitations that I mentioned, um, having to rebuild the board, having to find new funders, and it builds upon itself. So with every small success, um, you can get on to the next step, uh, to the next piece. If anyone wants to see the strategic plan, it's, it, I think it looks cool. I'm pretty proud of it, and I would be um, happy to share that. So, one of the questions we had as we transitioned into hearing Marielle is, how would you modify the models you're hearing about um, to fit in your own local scenario? So what's your problem that you're trying to, to meet um, and find solutions to? The uh, Alberta um, has a diverse number of localized advocacy groups, but no real provincial advocacy group. And the provincial body that exists is primarily organized around racing. Uh, racing? Yeah, UCI, uh, compliant racing, providing commissioners, etc. And I'm the vice chair, I guess, of the Recreation and Transportation Committee at that provincial level, but have three people to do that work, so that that would be hugely remodeling. Yeah, yeah, so just again taking the theory of change and pulling pieces of it that it can help you build the, build the plan that gets actually stuff done. Yeah, yeah. But also then having that theory of change, like what is, what is recreational and transportation cycling look like in Alberta? You can do that through your change as well. Any other thoughts? We'll have time at the end for questions. And which reminds me, please, like, aggressively signal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to let me know that I'm not going over. I'll just go, mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, that's our signal. So, hi, I'm Marielle Brown. I am the Director of Policy and Strategy at Trailnet. It's a local uh, advocacy organization in St. Louis. We work on biking and walking and getting people moving. We are 501c3 that does planning, programming, and policy. So like most nonprofits, uh, we have many different audiences. You know, we deal with the, we go to the community, we work with people who are writers, we're very aggressive writers, we work with our elected officials, and we also work with agency staff. You know, all of the engineers and planners, uh, local government partners that we have. How many people here work for a local government? Okay, cool. So I'm talking about how we as advocates work with you. I think this is applicable to all of you and we're not being manipulative. Mm -hmm. How many people are engineers? Okay, I might say a couple of not nice things about engineers. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's not about you. It's about the engineers that I work with that are not at this conference. <laughs> so, <laughs> these, are, these are our agency staff and partners that we work with. There's one elected official in this photo, but you know, every day as we're working with these people, they have a lot of discretion over the actual way that things happen in our community. Like the mayor can say, yes, I want bikes to be honored and I want us to be a platinum city. But, you know, when it comes down to, are we going to have a 10-foot wide traffic lane or a 12-foot wide traffic lane, it's really that woman in the gray sweater that's going to make the decision. So I want her to be motivated and thinking about how bicycling is helpful for the city. Um, and I think we really have to step back and keep in mind that not all engineers are at this conference. You know, this project won or is nominated for an award right now by ASHCO uh, for community development and quality of life. And it's in Oregon. It's like, this is like an hour south of Portland, and that's a, an outlet mall next to a freeway interchange. And to be fair to this project, it is actually a lot better than what used to be there, and it does improve access to transit and walking and biking. But in the grand scheme of things, this is not what we want to see as like a quality of life. But this is what our engineers have been trained on for, for some part, depending on how old they are, depending on what school they went to. Uh, this is still what their professional organization is handing out awards to. And so we have to be careful that we're not just pushing them and thinking like, oh, why are you guys being so rude? You know, like this is part of their worldview. And I always try to remind myself, I, we have a very strict uh, vehicular cyclist movement at my 
city. And when I talk to the vehicular cyclists, they're just like, you guys are so wrong. Why are you out there pushing protective bike lanes? Why are you out there pushing bike lanes? Like, your bike lanes are killing people. And I get very defensive and I shut down, especially when they um, talk about my LCI or say, you know, LCI is not useful. You have to learn cycling savvy. Otherwise, you're just teaching people the wrong thing. I do not move forward well with those conversations. I get so proud of being an LCI, I get so proud of being a planner, and and like so dug into the issues, and it doesn't move anyone forward. So we want to be sure that when we're working with our engineers and our planning staff, they're really being sensitive to what their formation is, like what their background is, and how much we're asking them to change. Just, so what is an LCI? It's um, League Certified Instructor, uh, the League of American Bicyclists, education program, sorry. Thank you for reminding me that everyone knows. So the idea of engineering judgment, the idea of like the rational planning model where the planners are going to go through all of these steps and figure out what the best idea is, that really comes from an era when psychology hadn't really recognized all of the cognitive biases we have. I think that Charles um, Barber did a great job of talking about the history of psychology, talking about psychology. Um, and we didn't really, we used to think that people were rational for some reason. You know, they would like, be able to weigh all of these decisions and then they like come up with it. Over the last 40 years, there's been amazing research on cognitive biases and how you know, we really seek to confirm what we already believe and what we're already thinking. And then when you're in the workplace, you have even more motivation to do that because you really want to confirm what your boss wants you to do or what your mayor wants you to do. And you also have this burden of professional judgment you know you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing by your professional organizations that you're not violating your the certifications that you've spent years getting so all of that is to say like framing matters and when we're working with our partners we need to be very respectful of all of this baggage that they're bringing into the decisions but then also think how can we change it because you know if you're at a, at a narrow frame or if you're in a frame that's really focused on automobiles you're not going to have you're not going to be able to consider all of the other solutions that might be possible. So how do we do that? That's my question still, but one thing that I found really useful is industrial organizational psychology. There's a whole branch of psychology dedicated to how people work, or to looking at how people act in the workplace. So I try to approach the people that we're working with, our partners, as this is their job, how, what can industrial organizational psychology tell us about people in the workplace, especially if they're trying to adapt to change. Um, I'm going to go over what I found to be the most useful theory. Uh, it's pretty old, but Victor Vroom came up with expectancy theory, and it's really focusing on motivation. And when you want people to do things, you really need them to be motivated for change. And it's difficult. We kind of talk about it in the advocacy world. We're like, oh, so-and-so gets it. You know, They really get it. Let's talk to them. But we need to make sure that more people get it. And we need to be sure that more people are ready to act. So Victor Vroom is a great name if you're trying to motivate people, I think. <laughs> so uh, it's a three-part theory. It's really a heuristic. It's, um, there is in the official theory a lot of math, but Victor Vroom has said, yeah, that was wrong. It's just a heuristic. And I think it's a very useful guide for kind of thinking through the different ways we can motivate people and all of the different aspects of how to get people motivated. I also want to give a disclaimer that industrial organizational psychology and motivation theory gets much more complex. It also goes into things that we can't impact, like uh, how much you're paying someone or how well they're getting promoted. You know, we really can't do that as advocates. But we can look at expectancy. So the idea that your effort will lead to performance. I know that a lot of our engineers don't really feel like this is necessarily true. That's why we do pop-ups, so that we can prove to them or let them experience it like, oh, hey, if you put stuff out in the street, cars will actually slow down and move, or move differently. They don't necessarily believe that. They don't have the opportunity to learn that sometimes. And so it's very important for people to actually believe that's true, that they can make a difference. Oh, one last thing I wanted to say. The ability to control outcomes is really important uh, in terms of motivating people. We talk a lot about like, oh, we want to get to like 50% mode share, 10% mode share, whatever it is. Be respectful that when you're trying to force that or trying to encourage your uh, governmental partners to do that, they're thinking that's not something I can control. You know, like I can't get people out on bikes. But if you reframe it as, oh, we want 80% of people to be within a quarter mile of a low stress bike route, that's an ambitious goal. 
but they can actually control it. They can map it out, they can change this, they can change that, you know, they can buffer the bike lane, and then they can say, oh, we got to that 80% goal. So it's just be careful of how you frame uh, goals and that you are pushing someone to commit to something that they can't control. Um, the next thing is the instrumentality or the performance will lead to outcomes. So the idea is that you would have, um, that you would get praise or recognition. We really can't give people raises if they do the bike lane or do the bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure we want. But we can also show them that you know they're not going to get as much criticism as they think they're going to get. That's at least for the government agencies that I work with. That's like their primary motivator that they don't get too many angry phone calls. Um, and so we really need to show them that they're they're going to make people happy. They're not going to get that many angry phone calls. Um, and then finally, valence. Do you want the outcome? Um, sorry, got a little bit cut off. But it's really there are three possible values: avoiding the new design or not really wanting the outcome. I certainly work with a few people that don't really want this because it just complicates things. Um, they might be indifferent, like, hey, they're not opposed to the new pedestrian infrastructure, but they're not really for it either. And then finally, the thing we want, welcoming the new design, people who really get it and who see the benefit. So how do we do this? Once we, did, once we started thinking about uh, motivation, how did it change our work? The first thing I did is I used to manage our planning department. I went through, and we acted as outside planning consultants, I went through our entire planning scope and process and thought about all of the ways we interact with our staff and what ways are we motivating them? Are there opportunities to motivate them more? It resulted in a lot more meetings, but it also resulted in them having a lot more opportunities to kind of feel like to learn more, to feel like they can make a difference, and to also see um, that people might like it. It also really impacts the campaigns that we do that involve agency staff. And then finally, this is about workplace psychology. If you have a workplace, you know, you can think about it in terms of your own staff too and how you support and motivate them. So the real impact of it is we started doing a lot of study tours. Study tours really hit all three forms of motivation. You get to talk to your peers and the peer city that did something better and the peers usually are able to say, yes, we're so glad we did this, it worked so well, you know. Um, so you're working on the expectation that you'll get praise, you're working on that, helping people realize that it works. And then also, hopefully, you're taking them to a place that's just so cool. They're like, yes, I want that future. So here are engineers and community advocates in Portland experiencing a bike boulevard or a neighborhood greenway. We're doing pop-up demonstrations. This is my favorite thing because it really lets people like experiment in real time with how these small street changes can create huge behavior changes in the way people drive. And this might not look like we have agency staff, but those are our aldermen's children there. So <laughs> it's just, just out of the frame. But you know, they're a lot more committed now that they see how effective our uh, crosswalk was. <laughs> um, next thing is collaborative processes. So really helping people get over the idea that if they make these changes, they're going to have all these angry drivers yelling at them. It takes a long time, but when you have your agency staff working with all of the other agencies that they might not have a lot to do with if you can bring in the health department and the parks department. Um, it helps a lot. It helps everyone kind of come together and it also helps people realize like they're not going to get in trouble for trying to change the way things happen. And then finally, community meetings and making sure that your agency staff and your elected officials are there. So the mayor of this town was here. We just set up our plan review in a pop-up plaza we also set up during the farmer's markets. We had community member members just showing up. We had the mayor, we had um, agency staff as well, and it was a pop-up so they got to see how uh, the street changes when you make changes. It was very successful and it really moved this plaza idea that I had from something that was kind of like, eh, that's not even going to be in the final plan because you're crazy, to, oh my gosh, this is now the premier project of our plan and we have to implement it. So it's really, it's very powerful to think about the different ways we're motivating people and making sure that they're really feeling like they can make a change. So, <laughs> really quickly, the three things I want to say is, the downsides of this turnover happens, you can invest all this time and then your engineer moves to Portland or your, <laughs> darn it. Um, it doesn't address policy. We live in a place where we don't have street design standards a lot of the time, so we're really focusing on motivating staff. And then finally, be aware of different styles of learning. You know, not everyone's going to be persuaded in the same way. So, my question for you is, have you ever motivated your staff to do something differently? <sighs> 
have you had any success trying to motivate them to change the way they work? Yes? Um, not my staff, but um, folks that I collaborate with. Um, I'm from Durham, North Carolina, and um, you know, we do TDM outreach and things like that, and we traditionally work with employers. Um, but um, from my background and from some other best practices trips that I've done, um, decided to go down the route with property managers in the development community. And I don't think that they were used to such a collaborative effort, although they work obviously with the city and planning and transportation and economic development, and they work not really with transit. They really don't work with transit. But they're used to dealing with either the chamber or the economic development. And so um, through my um, contacts and through my relationships with a variety of people, went in there to say, we can get a bigger bang for the buck if you work with a property manager that has, you know, 500 employers at their site instead of trying to address every one of 500 employers individually. Mm -hmm. So um, putting together, collaborating with the city planning, transportation, and economic development, which is a mess in itself, so I hear, um, you know, this one doesn't talk to that one. They have conflicting ideas. But I'm an outsider in a way. So I'm coming in and kind of playing stupid, like, I don't, does everybody works nice together, don't they? <laughs> yes, we do. Right. And I tell them how they should be working right, nice right. together. <laughs> and so we've pulled all those resources together as resources, and I've started a series of work sessions for the development community mm -hmm. with the transit agency and economic development and the planners and transportation. And by the way, uh, parking staff from a, a neighboring city <laughs> So that questions come up and go, how come Raleigh does it that way? Yeah. I said, I don't know how to answer that question, so let's bring the Raleigh guy in. Yeah. You know, so, but it's really, I'm on my second session October 13th. It's really working nice on this development community is going, wow. That's nice. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there's so many preconceptions because everybody's so disjointed. Right. They're just saying, you know, we can't afford to pay for park and ride so people can ride transit, you know, right. our tenants. We're like, what? We don't have to pay for park and rides? What do you, you know, right, they, right, they're, right. they're thinking there's this big investment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the transit agency does the parking rides that you can use for free. Mm -hmm. So with that one dispelling of that one uh, preconceived notion or myth mm -hmm. is worth it. And then more come out. So it's been really, really successful. And, and I'd like to hear your different, I like the different approaches you have mm -hmm. about bringing people together mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. perspectives mm -hmm. of what can change right. and what's in and out of their control. Right. We assume a lot of times that people know what's going on or that yeah. we assume that we have to do it all by ourselves um, and people it, it goes a long way just to talk to someone I mean it sounds so trite standing up here and saying that but a lot of times we assume that people just know what's going on right so yeah to even uh, bring them into the conversation right. And, and see what they want to do to be part of the process. Well, and you come, you know, sometimes it's okay to come with a completely different idea. Hi, I have this idea, what do you think? And like you said, engage them so they're part of it. And the person you're talking to, say economic development, knows that there's discord, not necessarily discord, but disconnect between these yeah. different departments at the city. And guess what? Her brilliant idea was, why don't you do it? Because then it's not us trying to change everybody's perspective yeah. internally at the city. Why don't you do it? Right. You know. Let's go ahead and get a few more questions yeah. in before we're done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm a volunteer uh, advocate uh, in Portland, Oregon, and I was wondering if you have uh, any advice on how to uh, either incorporate tier of change or how to just make change happen uh, in uh, sort of strategic uh, moments when there's a shift in the political landscape. Uh, we have a mayor who is exiting in January, we have a council member who is up for re-election, uh, and recently there is uh, a series of tragic traffic crashes yeah. uh, in Portland okay. streets and where we got a lot of community energy to uh, try to press the city to do right. more immediate change. Uh, but nothing has really happened, and I'm kind yeah. of feeling that that energy might dissipate. Uh, right. So how do we capitalize yeah. uh, these strategic moments I think the simplistic answer to that is, you know, embedding policy, right? And that policy is supposed to be forever and outlast administrations and that there's a policy handoff, um, which is what we'd all like to believe. But, you know, different administrators will go, that policy sucks and I'm putting it aside. And I'm going to bury yeah. it deep underground never to be seen again. So I think there's an education uh, piece where an advocate or an advocacy organization can request, you know, once the election has occurred and before the office changes over, 
um, or even with candidates doing an education forum on the existing policies that are current in, in Portland that have borne fruit, gotten great results, you know, with data to support it and say this is something that as advocates we, we think is very, very important to stay on your radar. You know, doing an education forum like that. We did um, a forum once for our mayoral candidates, and we basically said, we're going to ask you questions about all of these things. Mm -hmm. And then they had to prep and read about them. It was very effective, mm -hmm. because they wouldn't have read about them otherwise. They actually showed up? Yeah, they showed That's up. great. It was, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I just have a quick question uh, for, um, about the, the pop-ups. Um, so is that, is that an initiative um, that was kind of done in conjunction with the municipality, or was that sort of as a demonstration for uh, not only for the, the community, but like for decision makers and things as well? Like, I was just kind of wondering what your approach is to that. Um, we've done several pop-ups, so it'll be the level of municipal um, involvement and what our ultimate goal is kind of changes with everyone. The picture I showed was really just kind of community involvement. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously we always do them with municipal involvement and the more you can get your um, your staff kind of evaluating the plans and even helping you to set up, the more ownership they're going to take over how that change is possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can do it on your own, but then you're just kind of energizing yeah. the community. If you want your engineer to have a lasting change, make sure that mm -hmm. they're out there setting up the um, bills of hay. Yeah, I would say the same thing. We've done a series of pop-ups, and it's it's crit critical in our in our perspective to have the municipality involved, or else right. you're just a gorilla. You know, it's just parking day, right? Where you're taking out the street um, and maybe pissing everybody off. Um, so we have, you know, we believe in inside game, outside game. As an advocacy organization, this is part of our inside game. And it has gone beautifully, I mean beautifully, with every community we've worked with. They've been scared and tentative and afraid and, oh my god, you know, there's going to be massive crashes. And on the other side of it, they're like, whoa, that was so easy. So, yeah, I think, I think, sorry, just a comment, uh, like, in situations where the municipality might be kind of really resistant, Mm -hmm. to using that as a form of communication um, or building community support for things like the technical side things. I just, I don't know, it's, it's, it seems like, yeah. yeah we can talk to you afterward about yeah, some so of that, yeah. how that all worked. Yeah, and to be honest, my crosswalk actually was a huge failure in the city. <laughs> this, we can no longer paint crosswalks. Oh! <laughs> um, so, <laughs> don't have just to step back. In yeah. the spirit of asking for permission after the fact, I saw a TEDx talk of someone who built a protector, yeah. painted yeah. a protector in the middle of the night, and then people said, wow, this is an amazing Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not to get thrown in jail. Right. <laughs> no, that was a happy story, but so yes. you really do need to build it. Yeah. Our executive director went out in the middle, of, well, that wasn't the middle of the night, it was morning, filling potholes in a bike lane, and a reporter from the Chicago Sun-Times was walking by. He said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm filling a pothole. Click. Anyway, <laughs> newspaper, unintended consequence. But, um, you know, it got a little bit of action. He didn't get thrown in jail, to my knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> think carefully. Sometimes it's the right thing yeah. to do, sometimes, sometimes not. Think yeah. carefully. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. Is that right? Is it 10.30? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you.